Hello there, and welcome back to Civics. In this special episode, we're going to be talking about voting and why it's so important for our functioning democracy. So let's get started talking about voting, as it is Election Day, and you can see I've got my Election Day attire on, so we're ready to go. Let's talk about what voting is exactly first. Before I do that, we're just going to move me up here into this corner. There I am. All right, so what is voting? Well, it's when individual citizens make their voices heard in government by choosing an elected official or saying yes or no on a single issue. At least that's how it works in the United States. Voting is what gives ordinary citizens a voice and power in our government, and without voting, tyranny would reign. All right, um, it's it's what makes us a, a free country, right, because we're we're allowed to vote. Governments with voting are called democracies, republics, or representative systems. And that's what we live in. We live in a republic. And it's a republic because we vote for representatives. Um, we're not a democracy because we don't vote directly on the issues all the time. But we use that word a lot to kind of as a catch-all for any system with voting in it. How and when do Americans vote? Well, we vote in November on Tuesdays which is weird, and we'll get to, I'll explain why that happens. Um, Americans uh, could vote every year, depending on where they live and what their local government entails. So there's a possibility that every year you could you could vote in an election. Um, but the major elections in the United States happen every two years. Um, sometimes they're presidential elections, and other times they are called midterm elections. Uh, the one we're doing today in 2022 is a midterm election, and that's because it's in the middle of Joe Biden's first term as president. Presidential elections happen every four years, and because that's how long it takes for a president to have a term. And then midterm elections are the major elections that happen in the middle of a presidential term. Why did that happen? Whatever. The president is not on the ballot this time, but his ideas and policies are. The people who are running are running either f kind of saying, I'm a pro what the president is doing, or I'm not for what the president is doing. So that's really what the midterms is all about. It's kind of a test to see if the president's agenda and his ideas are being well received by the people or not. Um, each election year is important because we choose the people who are gonna represent us for the next two years, minimally, right? So if you're electing someone who's gonna go to the House of Representatives, that's gonna be two years that they're, that they're in, in Congress. If you're voting for a Senator, maybe, that could be a six year term. If you're voting for a governor today, that could be a four year term or maybe even longer or shorter, depending on the state. They're a little different in each one, right? There's different time variants of, of who you're electing and for how long, but still it's important, right? To know who you're voting for and, and what they believe in. So what do we vote on? Well, each major election, there's a few different things that we could vote on. And here's kind of, it's not an exhaustive list, but here's a pretty solid list of the things we vote on in the United States. Local officials like sheriffs, judges, city government officials like the mayor or like a city council person. Sometimes they're called aldermen, stuff like that. Citywide referendums or initiatives. So sometimes cities will have a referendum. The city I live in has a referendum right now. It's about funding the school district. So that is a citywide referendum, asking the city for money to invest in our schools. State representatives, governors, and state judges are also usually on the ballot. And this year in Wisconsin, which is where I live, our governor is up for election, all of our state representatives, and no judges this time, no state judges this year. State referendums, um, sometimes states have entire referendums, and that's only in certain states. Um, so for instance, they might say, do you think the government should legalize marijuana? That could be a referendum. And so then you say yes or no. And so then if they say yes, then the government's going to look into legalizing it. And because the people spoke, they have to do it. That's kind of how the referendum works. State recall elections happen in some states where uh, maybe uh, like a governor or a representative might have done something wrong or is doing something wrong. And the people have decided that they're going to recall them, which means they would replace that person with somebody new um, my state had one of those several years ago. They, we tried to recall the governor. It didn't work. Um, so that that happens every once in a while. And then federal officials like Congress people, senators, or the president or some other things that we that we vote for. You'll notice that we don't have recalls or referendums at the national level, and that's because they're not in the Constitution. Individual states can, because each individual state can run their their individual republic the way they want to. But at the, uh, the national level, we would need a constitutional amendment to have referendums like that. 
There are, of course, some restrictions to voting. For one, you got to be 18. That's the, the golden barrier. If you're 18 years old, you are allowed to vote in this country. Um, after that, there are pretty few restrictions. Um, however, there are a few. For instance, if you're convicted of a felony in some states, that means you're not allowed to vote anymore. Um, if you have, you have to be a citizen to vote in certain elections, like the presidential election, you have to be a citizen to vote in those. Um, but like local elections, you can vote. So it kind of depends on what it is you're voting for. And then also in many states, you must show an ID to vote that has special information on it. So like in Wisconsin, we have to get special IDs that are different that have all the special requirements for voting on it. So now our IDs are different than they were before because of our voter ID law. Let's talk a little bit about America's voting history, because that gives us an important snapshot as to how voting has worked in this country for a long time. Let's start off all the way back in colonial America. Uh, in colonial America, very few people were actually allowed to vote. Citizens who owned enough land were allowed to vote, and that's because they thought that those people could be fully invested in the outcome of the elections because they had something worth protecting. People who just owned a business and maybe a house didn't have enough investment in the country, so they weren't allowed to vote. Women, the poor, people of color, and business owners were not allowed to vote. Like I said, right, they didn't meet that land requirement. Under the Constitution, things didn't change immediately, but um, in the first decade or so, um, the, uh, the franchise was expanded so that the majority of white men could vote. Um, basically, they decided, hey, we should probably let all men, all white men vote. Um, this was done because the Electoral College and the Senate were thought to be adequate safety measures to ensure the right person was elected president. The Founding Fathers did not trust the average citizen to vote on something that important. That's why they came up with something so convoluted like the Electoral College to make sure that if it came down to it, the right person would become president. We don't have a truly democratic system because of this Electoral College, and it's because the people who made this country didn't believe in us. And honestly, sometimes, yeah, that's fair. We don't do great things all the time. The Senate was the same thing. Originally, the Senate um, senators were chosen by the state legislators, so they weren't voted on. Now we vote on senators. We didn't used to. After the Civil War, African-American slaves were freed under the 13th Amendment and then guaranteed equal rights under the 14th and 15th. Black men were now allowed to vote and hold office for the first time in American history, and they did so in large numbers um, during this time, the first black congressmen and senators were elected in the South, um, representing states like Louisiana and Mississippi. However, only 20, 30 years later, Reconstruction ended in the South and white Americans reasserted themselves into power. They passed local ordinances called Jim Crow laws that restricted the rights of African Americans. And under these Jim Crow restrictions, African Americans lost the right to vote until the 1960s when the civil rights movement would win that right back. So basically using voter intimidation, groups like the Ku Klux Klan and just regular people in general would stop people of color from voting in the South. Um, in the North, it wasn't always easy for them to vote either. Some states would implement things like what are called poll taxes. So you'd have to pay a fee to vote or what they would do is they would institute something like a literacy test. So they would make a test to prove that you were literate enough to vote, and they made the test impossible to pass unless you were unless you knew what the test was about. So they would uh, everybody would be in on it except for the people they didn't want to have vote. The Nineteenth Amendment came around in nineteen nineteen, um, so the hundredth year anniversary of women voting was just two years ago, uh, three years ago now and um, it extended suffrage to women. Um, however, it did not extend voting rights to all women, right? People who were not white, so people of color, Blacks, Asians, Hispanics, Indigenous Americans, anybody who wasn't a white American still could not vote in American elections. They were restricted by those Jim Crow laws. The passing of the 19th Amendment was a hard fight, however, because people did, women did die to get the 19th Amendment passed. They were people who were killed trying to protest and fight for this amendment. So it's not like it's not a big deal. I'm not trying to say that the 19th Amendment was not huge, but it was not all encompassing as people think of it as, right? People are like, oh, the 19th Amendment, that's lo lo allowed women to vote. It allowed white women to vote. It did not allow everyone to vote. It's a bit important distinction to say. The Voting Rights Act of 1965 was signed by President Lyndon B. Johnson and was a hard-won victory for the civil rights movement. 
The law banned the practices in the South, like poll taxes and literacy tests that kept Black Americans from voting. This is what was going to allow people of color to start voting just like they should have been 100 years ago in the 1860s when the Civil War ended. Um, the Voting Rights Act greatly shook up American politics as now a large population of Americans could vote and they voted often. They did not like the fact that they couldn't vote before and they were going to make sure that they voted en masse now that they were able to. The 26th Amendment, uh, the last voting amendment, came in 1973 and it lowered the voting age nationally to 18 years old. Before that, it was 21. Um, this amendment was proposed because Americans as young as 18 were dying overseas in Vietnam, and it really seemed appropriate that these same people could vote at home if they were willing to go over the ocean to fight in a war for us. So um, it was it was kind of seen as like, well, if we're going to make you go fight in our wars, we're going to let you vote on the people who decide when those wars happen, which was a really big deal um, that those group, those people, right, um, deserve that much. Um, 18 to 24 year olds are still the voting block that votes the least out of any age group, um, despite the large voting power they have. We have lots of young people in this country, um, and if they all voted, um, it would definitely shake up um, politics as we know it. Um, but traditionally, they don't vote as much as other age groups, like the 65 plus age group, which is the highest represented voting group in the United States. Today, voting is becoming a hot topic again. Um, movements to add restrictions on voting, like voter ID laws, ending mail-in voting, and other things are gaining momentum. Uh, meanwhile, at this election that's happening today, there are self-appointed election defenders who are sitting near polling places armed with rifles, uh, who are in intimidating people, who are trying to stop people from voting. Um, after the 2020 election, faith in our voting systems has fallen in certain parts of the country. Um, and while more and more people are casting ballots, the 2020 election right, saw the highest voter turnout in a long time. Millions of people voted in the 2020 election, but there are certain people who are casting doubt on that election, and that's becoming a problem. Um, it's essential for a functioning democracy to have easy access to the polls with no voter intimidation, or else our system is broken. It's not working anymore. We're not a representative democracy. Easier access to voting is a growing need in the United States of America, and it's something that some people are really taking up while others are trying to restrict it as much as possible. Let's talk a little bit about ways we could improve our voting systems in the United States to make it easier for people to vote, right? Because it's a cornerstone of our democracy. We should be making it as easy as possible. For one, we could make Election Day a national holiday. Uh, in recent years, there's been a movement to do that or to change the day to Sunday. The Constitution set Election Day as Tuesdays in November because back when the country was first founded, America was an agrarian country, and so people had to travel from their farms all the way into town to vote. And so we made it on a Tuesday because Sunday people would go to church, and then Monday they could travel so that on Tuesday they could vote. That was the reason the system was put in place. This isn't needed anymore. There are polling places everywhere. It's as easy as ever to vote. We would have to ever have a constitutional amendment to change that because it's written in the document. So if we wanted to change the day, we would have to amend the Constitution. Instead, Election Day could become a national holiday, which would free up more people to vote um, and make it easier. Another thing that other major democracies are doing are doing automatic voter registration. Uh, some states have begun doing this, like Oregon, where they just register people to vote once they turn 18, much like the Selective Service Act. In the United States, when you're a boy and you turn 18, you have to sign up for the Selective Service Act, which basically means you can be drafted. At the same time, we can register people to vote. This would make it easier for people to vote as there would be no hassle of registering and the state would just do it for you. Um, this is a common practice in many other advanced democracies um, and it's gonna make it easier to vote. So you just show up the day of and you, you'll know you're registered because everybody is. We also need to have more polling places available. During the 2020 election, polling places in some states were closed and consolidated, which made it difficult for people without transportation, like people who are poor or elderly. They couldn't vote because they just couldn't get to the place to vote. The government should ensure that there are even more polling places available throughout the country, making sure that everyone can easily access a polling location. An expansion of voting by mail and early voting would also help reduce the congestion on an actual election day by allowing voters to cast their ballots earlier, which is what we do. Me and my family, 
we get our votes ahead of time. They get sent to you in the mail. You fill them out. You have a witness sign your envelope and you send it back. It's fairly easy. And then we don't have to go the day of and wait in line. Some countries have even began experimenting with online voting or text voting using encrypted texts or emails. Several countries in Europe have successfully implemented this internet voting into their repertoire of voting mechanisms. For instance, in 2004, the Danish population, right? So the, um, the Danish are the people in Denmark, voted by email for European Parliament. The UK has implemented e-voting into some of their parliamentary elections, and Estonia and Ireland are also planning on adding e-voting in the near future. So there are countries that are doing this in very secure ways that still work, and it's not as big of a hassle as people make it out to be. It's very easy, and it works. So that could greatly increase the amount of voting that happens. You have to have like a secure login or something. We could use social security numbers as our usernames and passwords. And you'd log in, you'd vote, and then you'd be done, right? You can get it done from home on your phone. The other thing that could really help um, with voting is spending limits for candidates. Currently, the rules for campaign spending in American elections are very sparse. And so beefing up these rules and regulations or capping the amount of political spending per candidate could level the playing field. This matters for voting because incumbents often can spend more money than new candidates and it skews who people vote for. So spending limits even that advantage out and allow everybody to be on an even playing field in elections. So that's an important voting thing that we could change as well. Thanks for watching this episode of Civics. I hope if you're 18, you went out and you voted today or you got your, your ballot in advance and you voted. If you didn't vote, that's okay. It happens, we understand your next elections in two years, go out and vote then. Get involved in the process. Um, it's the only way that we can make our country better. So please do get involved and vote. Thanks again for watching and we hope you learned something today. Thanks again, see you soon.